Welcome back. Now, according to statistics, one in four Kenyans is likely to suffer from a mental disorder at one point in their lives. The month of May is dedicated to raising awareness about mental health. And with the statistics I just gave, we can't afford to stay silent on this matter. Tonight, we are looking at Kenya's failed mental health system. What ails it and what solutions are currently being formed to remedy it? Well, let me introduce my guest. Dr. Oscar Gidua. He is the first forensic psychologist in East and Central Africa and an assistant professor at, of psychology at USIU Africa. We also have joining us an extended panel, mini audience made up of students from the University of Nairobi and USIU as well. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, let me begin with you, Dr. Gidua. Uh, just in terms of getting a sense of what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. The current state of mental health in this country, we're not going to get into the nitty gritties of what mental health is, but just a general sense of where are we when it comes to mental health. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Victoria, for this opportunity, uh, first and foremost. And I think that for us to start tackling the question about mental health in our country, we have to recognize where we've come from, where we are and where we're planning to go. Uh, where we are is that we are a country that is unique with a lot of cultures that have kept us very robust and stoic over the years. Uh, systems of accountability and support that we had, which had and relied on the extended family unit mm. to actually impart, you know, kind of like comfort and stuff for, uh, to people. However, over time, as those systems have broken down, we're now starting to see gaps in people having support. So you start seeing people having more issues of isolation, mm. questions about going through things on their own and not really having support. Now, I don't even want to start on the gender question because that, that I think we'll talk a little bit uh, further into the program. Mm. However, the way men and women respond to these challenges that, that are happening is very different and unique. Uh, let's also talk about where our country is, yeah. uh, the macro issues, yeah. the economy, the state of the nation, uh, how people feel about each other, questions like tribalism, uh, things like violence, crime. All of these things then set you up for a country that is sitting on a volcano, mm. which is what I like to say in terms of a, of a metaphor, that we are actually going through a process where people are just waiting to be triggered because of all of these pre-existing conditions. Right. Now, let's not even talk about biology, because biology also contributes to who actually ends up developing a mental illness. Uh, the statistics you just gave, mm. the one in four, is actually pretty accurate. And you can imagine if one in four people are predisposed to actually getting a mental illness, what do we really need to be doing? Then where are we? We've at least started doing some things. Nationally, there's laws that have actually been curated yeah. to, to this effect. You have the Mental Health Bill. You also have the Counselors and Psychologists Act of 2014. You also have the Mental Health Policy, which are national frameworks, which will actually help us deal with mental health as a country. Yeah. Um, then once we go from there, we're saying that then we're at the point of, of I want to call it awakening, and, and I don't want to sound, uh, you know, I don't want to sound uh, funny, but the, the point is that I think as a country we're starting to get the point of awareness mm. of what mental health looks like. We used to hear it, but now we're starting to see it. Right. And there's a difference with Africans. Africans like symbolism. Africans love evidence. And once we see it, we now start listening. Now we're hearing it and we're seeing it. So I think we're going to start doing something, putting things in place, yeah. places where people can go for help, training psychologists, counselors, psychiatrists, people in the mental health system that can actually uh, help us. So I think if we start from that point, at, at, least, at least from where I stand, yeah. we'll actually be making some headway. You mentioned uh, that we are in an age of awakening when it comes to mental health. And I was having this conversation with a colleague earlier about we seem to be hearing more and more of these yeah. stories of people mm -hmm. who, you know, kill a spouse mm. or an ex-lover. And yes. you're wondering, is it that we have more cases now, mm. or this has been the case, but we're just talking more about it? Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I want to say that it's a mixture of both. Yeah. Uh, one of them are uh, the proliferation of social media and other ways of communicating. Uh, there's no way we would have ever known if somebody was committing a crime like that or, or an act like that in the outposts of the country. Mm. Why not for social media and news coverage? I think that media houses have done a better job of, of actually covering stories like these. And so therefore, what seems to be an increase might yeah. actually, in fact, be probably status quo. 
or representing what's the case. However, I can't speak with authority about whether it's increased or it's decreased. However, I'm saying that we're seeing more of those instances going to fruition. Because again, mental illness does not necessarily mean that it has to end up in a dire or catastrophic end. What we're seeing is unmanaged mental illness getting to that end. Interesting, and I want to come to my extended panel. You know, even with this influx of information and, and stories and people sharing their experiences of mental health also comes a lot of misinformation and myths. And, and I really want to kind of hear from all of you in terms of some of the myths out there that you've heard um, that would prevent people from being open about you know, their mental health status or seeking help. Uh, I'll begin with you and start with your name as well. I'm Anita Buya. Thank you for the opportunity. I think one of the myths outside there is that people believe people with mental illness are violent and unpredictable. Therefore, they end up being, people don't want to associate with them. With them. It is a challenge outside there. So they see an extreme of a mm. mental disorder and feel if I come out saying I have a mental that's illness, right, yeah. that's what I'll be labeled. Mm -hmm. um, let me hear from two of our psych students here from UFSIU. <laughs> So thank you for having me. My name is Elizabeth Gishimo. I'm a, a doctorate student for psych clinical psychology at TSAU. Um, so there's also this concept that uh, if you have a mental illness, uh, it means that you're cursed. Hmm. And so it, there's something that you have done, uh, could be in, the, in your family, and as a result, now you're being punished. So that's why it's manifesting hmm. as mental illness. So that's one of the myths I've had of. And that's something that's embedded in community and true. culture Absolutely. that we see a, a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with someone like that who says, well, my family thinks it's a curse, you know, mm -hmm. and that's how it's been through generations. How do you begin to walk them out of that and learn a lot of those cultural beliefs? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, one of the things that I normally like to tell individuals is that as a human being, you're just not one aspect. So, because when they're talking about curses, they're going into the spiritual element, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah? Right. And that's okay, because that's part of us. But then also, um, there's also other aspects too. There's the psychological, there's the biological. And that's why, for example, if you feel you have a f something on your physical, like say you have a stomach problem, you'll go seek help from a yeah. doctor for that, right? And so, just demystifying that, indeed, you might be onto something, but just the same way, uh, for example, if you have a physical problem, you won't address it, you'll go to a doctor. So it's the same way uh, when it comes to issues to do with uh, your psychological aspect. You can uh, address it spiritually, but at the same time, why not seek a professional, a psychological professional? Because the people are not there just by fluke. I mean. Right. If the way God created the universe, if you believe uh, in that, uh, he put even psychologists there for a reason, isn't it? So addressing it as a holistic mm. uh, issue. Mm. And speaking of, yeah, you wanted to respond yeah, to that, Dr. I, I wanted to add to what uh, Elizabeth is talking about and say that one of the things that we found to be very uh, uh, viable in, in, in working together with people is including communities of faith mm. and their cultural communities. Yeah. Because it would actually be a fallacy to exclude someone from their community, as what Elizabeth said articulately, that it's part and parcel of who yeah. we are. Yeah. So you find that if you have someone, uh, the, the, the communities of faith or the leaders, talking to them to actually speak to their faithful or elders speaking to their people, but then educating them to be able to refer through their cultural systems to a psychologist or mental health mm. professional, that has more credence and credibility because if it comes from a point of authority like that, then you will actually listen to doing it. But if we came and transposed ourselves and said, oh, you have an issue, you have an issue, right. nobody's going to come to us. Right. So what we're finding as a, as a technique is to work together in collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an exciting time for us in Africa because I think um, in terms of what psychology has always looked at, the mm -hmm. West has led the way and they have their models of how they deal with things. And so we're learning from Latin America, we're learning from uh, uh, Aborigine uh, uh, Australians mm. and now from Africa that there are aspects about human beings that have never been accounted for when they were theorizing and talking about psychological interventions. Now we're starting to create those. And so we're becoming uh, the, uh, probably a uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pioneer yeah. in interventions as well. 
Very interesting, and I'm glad that you mentioned that in terms of kind of tailoring That's right. um, a lot of the approaches when it comes to treating someone with a mental disorder. Yeah. Uh, I just have to pull up a graphic to show the gap mm. when it comes to the number of patients and psychologists or wow. psychiatrists wow. available in this country. Um, so in terms of the ideal ratio, you can see up there, it <laughs> should be one to Fair every 30,000 patients for a psychiatrist. Right now, that ratio is one to 500,000 patients. Uh, when it comes to psychiatric nurses, it is supposed to be one uh, nurse to 6,000 patients. Uh, that right now in Kenya is one to slightly over 107,000 psychologists. It should be one to every 15,000 patients. Right now, it is one to, get this, every 4.6 million. Um, I'll just stop there because that is shocking. That is shocking. And when we talk about the system having a problem and we need to kind of train more mm. and feed them into the system to treat more people, that's not happening. That's right. Why? Um, that's, that's really great. Uh, although I, I think the, the, the ratio on the psychologists, I have to be a bit more modest about yeah. it. I think that number is a bit exaggerated because that would give us about only 10 psychologists in the country. In the country, yeah. That doesn't make For sense. For 46 that, yeah. that, does, that does make sense. I mean, roughly. Yeah. So I know, but the number is upwards anyway. I mean, it's still high, yeah. I mean, relatively. So I, I mean, the point is made that it's really high. One of the things we need to do is to actually train more psychologists. Mm. Uh, and train more counselors and train more mental health practitioners. Um, I like to talk about our country from the point of what do we aspire to as a nation? Yeah. Many times we talk about things like Vision 2030, which has three pillars, political, economic, and social. And, and it seems to me that economically we seem to be doing well. There's all these economic forums, there's all these things. People flying from all over the world with the epicenter of all these amazing billion dollar conferences. Politically, we seem to be moving forward in terms of people having space yeah. to express themselves. Socially, however, mm. Victoria, <laughs> yeah. we are in the dark ages. Mm. And I'm saying that with a lot of respect to the senior people who've actually been working on these programs in the country. The question becomes, how can we develop as a country economically and politically, but then leave our people behind socially? Socially means that we need to protect our people in how they actually even receive this development. We live in a very disparate country. I mean, places which have no access to anything and places that have access to way too much. And so because of that, you can imagine psychological dissonance that happens to a young person who leaves wherever they're leaving to come and see places like these ones. That's already a problem. And I know we do have devolution and this is starting to get to people. However, that should not be the case. We need to be deliberate in increasing the social standing of our people for us to say that we're developing very well. I think the more we talk about things, and I know the government is working on health programs to actually you know, like, you know, bring up the health status of, 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 of Kenyans. And what I want to say is that if we include mental health as one of the components under that health, uh, the, that health pillar, then we'll be doing a lot. Um, what's going wrong, what was what the question was, is that I do not think we are serious about uh, having a framework where psychologists and psychiatry, uh, psychiatrists mm. and counselors work because we don't have the legislation. I mentioned to you laws that are in place. However, are they alive? Yeah. Kenya is a beautiful country with amazing documents all over the place. But how are they being implemented? implemented? And yeah. that's a question we've always had over and over. And I don't know if this is a generation that's going to do it or it's the next one. But we need to really think hard about that because if, in fact, we still do not have a board of psychology and counseling, then who's, who are the Kenyans going to go see? Yeah. If we, in fact, don't have a board of mental health, then who is going to be regulating these mental health questions? And yet our people are suffering. I want to implore on our leaders, even as we speak in yeah. this. It's yeah. almost like I'm just plugging in a, a, a request from the psychology uh, fraternity that it is time for us to have those boards moving so we can actually have legitimately registered psychologists mm -hmm. and also cut off all the quacks that have actually been harming our people. The reason if we don't have a board, we're going to have quacks. Yeah. Someone will attend a two-week revival meeting and come out as a counselor. <laughs> um, yeah. My students here who are sitting here, I can tell you painfully for them, it's taken them years yeah. to get to where they are. And yeah. they've not even finished. And, and, and we respect the process of becoming a mental health practitioner because it's people's lives. It's people's families. Precisely. It's so, it's so, I revere it so much. I don't understand why people want to take it lightly mm. and say it's just talking. Mm. It's not just talking. You can't talk someone out of all the things you're seeing. 
there's a methodology yeah. and that methodology needs to be trained in all the academic institutions. I think it's time for Kenyans to imagine that even as we're doing more STEM uh, subjects, science, technology, engineering and mathematics, we need to also add other health sciences and things like psychology as well yeah. to actually become a key a cornerstone of our agenda. And therefore, if we do it like that, we'll have better funding for it. In terms of education, we're going to have people graduating and becoming useful to our people. I think that's one of the ways we can actually remedy that. I saw a really interesting statistic when I was doing research for this, and it said five in six Kenyans with a mental illness do not receive treatment. And, and I really thought, does this mean that there aren't enough mm -hmm. practitioners to serve them, or uh, stigma is still holding mm -hmm. back a lot of people from actually seeking mm -hmm. out these services. And I really want to kind of hear from yes, uh, the mini audience in terms of what is your, your view, your experience in terms of seeing maybe your colleagues, do they actually seek out these services or they're just not there for them to get? Okay, thank you very much for having me. My name is John Dago. I'm a student at the University of Nairobi. Personally, from the recent cases, you'll find that Five out of six, as you have said, you'll find that uh, may, uh, most of them happen in marginali marginalized areas mm. where you find that there are no efficient person personnel in, in the psychological department. Right. So the government has to implement a lot of issues. Currently, there is the Kenya National, uh, the, the Kenya national um, policy on mental health. This hasn't been fully implemented mm. as expected. And find that uh, what they reviewed and what they say they're going to do, they haven't done it. You'll find that if you go to marginalized areas like, like Northeastern, you'll find possibly there are no psy psychological centers to affect, to, to treat those I the illness. Right. What usually happens, they are transferred to Madare and find that uh, the, the occupation isn't that well established right. in Madari. Right. And we'll talk about Madari as well, because it also has its own, um, yeah. it has a bad rap, let's just mm. put it that way, yeah. uh, in, in addition, Kenyan society. Um, yeah. The, it's timely we are having this discussion. My name is Joyce yes. Mugi. I'm a student at USIU Africa studying doctorate in clinical psychology because we also are talking about universal health care. Mm. And it's around this time that we need to really think about access, not just to every region of Kenya, but also to marginalized groups. Right. I work a lot with groups of people with disabilities and other special mm. needs. Right. and. The inclusion of digital technologies is one way we could use to even reach people, for example, those who cannot hear or those who cannot see. And uh, mental health is really a universal need that cuts across. The World Health Organization describes health as not just the treatment of illnesses, but the holistic well-being. Mm. And so the move now needs to be a shift towards integration and use of different you know um, disciplines to address this so in my work for example with Daktari Africa we've been able to reach far-flung areas but mm. still we still find uh, groups of marginalized people uh, in those places so uh, I think the mental health act amendments need to be completed as soon as possible uh, so as to fill the treatment gap. This is an issue of justice, yeah, of absolutely. access. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And we'll talk about why right. they've delayed in actually yeah. implementing those amendments. Yeah. Yes, I see your comment Okay, there. thank you, Vicky, for having me here. My name is Mary Ojuang, Chairperson Waswa, and the Director for Women Affairs, Republican Liberty Party. And uh, t uh, I am for the school of thought that it's victimization that's stopping this group of people from coming out mm -hmm. uh, from the environment I live in and in the society we are in. This group of people are victimized and treated as hooligans. And uh, I have been to, from the uh, student's point of view, every university you'll find that this group of students are branded a bad name as goons. And uh, they are even discriminated, suspended, and expelled from institution of learning, institution, uh, institution, higher institution learning. Right. So it's quite sad that uh, we have this uh, act, but no one is catching up to find out exactly how these people need to be treated. And it's sad that people who are treating them like that are at one point mental ill. So we need to divert our attention from just uh, this discussion and doing more awareness on mental health. 
Yeah, we certainly need to normalize this discussion. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't have that issue of them being labeled as hooligans mm -hmm. or ruffians mm -hmm. or just someone who has gone cuckoo. That's right. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to be put in that group. But, uh, I mean, we definitely need to have more and more of these mm -hmm. kinds of discussions. Let's go quickly right. into that mental health bill, that yes. second reading in Senate right now. Yes. Um, you've gone through it, gone through the sittings as well. What are some of the issues or gaps that you've noticed okay. so far? Okay, first of all, what I want to say is that I'm actually impressed by it. Um, uh, let me begin with the positives. I, and I think that, you know, if you look at it as a document, it's pretty holistic because it's starting to address the question systemically and yeah. saying that uh, because of devolution, the roles of mental health are going to be devolved to the counties. What I like about that is because every county will have its own special way of addressing mental health issues. Uh, nationally, of course, there's going to be oversight. The Ministry of Health will actually have a di director of mental health, which they already actually do have. Yeah. But now in the new bill, you know, th there's going to be added responsibilities. To me, what I like about it is the fact that now the question of access, lack of discrimination, justice, as Joyce is talking about, all those things have been covered really adequately. <laughs> and I think that it will just take a matter of, 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 you know, of patience on our end because legislative processes take a long time. Yeah. I, I remember when we were involved with the Counselors and Psychologists Act 2014, we were really, really frustrated because, you know, uh, for us, especially in the private sector, sometimes we imagine that we can actually just move things very quickly. Mm -hmm. But you have to imagine a country that has been in existence for as long as it has been without that legislation will also need some time to really, you know, for us to acquiesce to, to what is in that bill. So I think that it has covered a lot of things yeah. in terms of like providing avenues through which people can actually be able to access mental health services, both in the private sector and in the public sector. They're mandated uh, from level two, three and four. Uh, facilities to actually have an outpatient clinic. Mm. Level five ones will have inpatient clinics. So to me, I think we're starting to build it. I yeah. like to say we're building the matatu as we drive it. Uh, and, and, and this matatu is, we're putting the wheels now. Yeah. On, and, and on a funny story about, and I know you don't talk about Madari, but one time I was going for a conference somewhere and uh, next to me was an old Mzungu man and he had me talking to my neighbor, the plane. And when we were talking, he, he tapped me and said, young man, are you Kenyan? Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, yes, I am. And how did you know? He said, oh, that's interesting. I, I helped design Madare. Wow. And that really just, I mean, to me at that moment in time, I, I really got stuck in this kind of thing. And, and, and sitting with the old man, uh, Dr. George uh, Clotes, uh, emeritus uh, professor at UCLA, he, he, he told me what the vision had been. Mm. And it somehow seems to me that our country seems to forget things. We had all these aspirations, and we as a country were thinking of mental health systems in the early 70s wow. and late 60s. You yeah. have to remember what happened. I mean, exactly. wh where did those people go? Yeah. And I know people who I talk with imagine that I probably have a very idealistic view of when we just started, we got independence and stuff, but it's not really idealism. It's saying that we were on a trajectory. What went wrong? That Madara was actually a very uh, a shining star. And right now, as you speak, with more than six or seven different programs running in the, in, the, in the hospital, I actually am one of the people who says that while it has had its challenges over time, right. it's starting to improve because you actually start seeing families understanding what it's there for. Mm -hmm. And so you see people going there and then they're getting even referral services somewhere else. So I want to say that the people who are there are actually really trying. And I'm never going to be on the bandwagon of anyone who says Madari is horrible because I think having the opportunity yeah. and, the, and the privilege of having seen better facilities, we are on the right track. And I think we need to actually also, as we change the conversation about mental illness, yeah. we also need to change the conversation about where mental health treatment happens. Absolutely. And that begins at Madari, the, the, the best known one. I think it's an amazing facility if you go there. You'll actually be, be, you'll be shocked. The people who actually, my heart goes out to the people who've worked there for decades and, and worked there, burnt out, many of them. Mm. You look at them and you're like, oh my goodness, your heart goes out to them. How have you been able to work without all these things in place? So what I do, I take a protectionist approach where I protect the work that they're doing and try to build their capacity to make them do better. Because I don't think that they chose that line of work mm. because they didn't like people or they right. didn't want to do a good job. So I, I, I kind of, you know, I'm more moderate when I, when, I, when I talk about Madare than most, but it's because I've seen it and I've talked to some of them. Their stories are incredible about what they've given up to actually ensure that Kenyan's mental health 
is actually working. Right. Yeah. And we should appreciate that it actually exists. That's you right. know, in the first place. In yeah. the first place. Yes. Uh, some feedback here from our viewers. Uh, they don't give their name. This is from SMS. Let the doctor tell us wow. whether mental illness varies from community to community or gender. Very interesting. But valid question. Yes. I'm sure, you yes. know, that's the thing. Yes. People oftentimes are ignorant about how this all works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, the, the, the first part of the question is not really one that we can validate with any form of research. Mm. So community, I want to say Kenyans are all Kenyans. Yeah. So I'll start there. Uh, the only one thing I'll say about community is depending on how much superstition we ascribe to as a people. And community does not mean ethnic uh, tribe. It actually means where we live. Uh, and if you think about community that way, yeah. then you can see, depending on how much we really believe in symbolism, mysticism, mm. religion, and relig and miraculous uh, getting out of things, that might affect how how you access mental health. The question on gender, however, yeah. is really unique. Yeah. As it is, Victoria, as it chemically, biochemically, we're different. Men and women are very different. So it means that if there's a hormonal or chemical imbalance, even how it manifests will be different. Number two, behaviorally, there'll be a big difference. So one of the ones I like to illustrate that's easy is how men and women react to something like depression. Mm -hmm. uh, most women, most times, will recluse, isolate, and take it inward. And so you find that most women will have cutting behaviors or, mm. or attempting uh, suicide or things like that. Yeah. But men end up becoming aggressive. So they externalize so it outward. outward. Okay. So men t uh, seem to be a more outward in, a, in, in expression of their, of their pain. Women seem to internalize that. So that's already just one very blanket example. Of course, there are very many yeah. others, and I can't generalize. However, that shows you already that even with one of the illnesses we've seen the most, there's a gender difference. Mm -hmm. in, term of how, in terms of how it's treated, culture comes into play to actually continue it because women are supposed to be quiet and meek. Yeah, yeah. So therefore, if you're isolating and you're keeping to yourself, you're a perfect woman, isn't it? <laughs> and if you're aggressive as a man, and if the culture says that men have to be aggressive and have mm. to be, you know, forceful everywhere they talk and loud and obnoxious, then you'll also continue perpetuating that illness and you won't see it. What's even worse in our community of faith, with a lot of respect to them, of course, part of our community, part of our families. However, if I come and I say that I heard from God, Victoria. That is a controversial question <laughs> because did I hear from God or am I hallucinating? Yeah. And that's something we really need to take seriously yeah. because, because, because you know, our communities of faith then become a harboring ground also of people who are very sick and we don't know. But then again, we pray for them and then, which is great. However, as I said, collaboration. Yeah, Can important. we help people who are in authority and actually who are stoic enough and balanced yeah. to help people get help? as opposed to just kind of like perpetuate it and continue telling, oh yeah, you're a, you're a prophet and, and someone's hallucinating. Another one here, and I'll, I'll pair it with another question that I had from the mental health bill. Alfred from Nyeri saying, I've been suffering from anxiety disorder and of late, uh, it has become too much. What could be the treatment? And on the treatment wow. question, because in the bill, there is one clause that has been a bit controversial mm. in that the individual who is seeking treatment will have a say as to what happens to them. Mm. And many times people would argue, are they in the right frame of mind mm. to mm. make that decision mm. Mm. Um, as opposed to abdicating it to someone else yes. to make that for them? Okay. And, and I think that's the other myth about mental illness. Yeah. Um, mental illness does not mean lack of mental capacity. In some cases, it could incapacitate someone from making rational decisions. Yeah. But most times, people actually still have the faculties enough to be able to consent to treatment. Because the person going through the illness is not necessarily the expert, consenting is just the level we want them mm. to be at. Just consenting that I'll be taken care of by professionals. Same thing like surgery. Let me, let me, let me give the example okay. of surgery. Yeah. If I'm going to go through heart surgery with a cardiologist, the best I can do, I won't tell him, oh, don't do a bypass, but do it. I mean, how yeah. do I know? Right. However, I'll say, doc, I give you the authority to go into my chest cavity and investigate what is going on with my heart. What the bill means, in fact, I think that's what it is. And yeah. I think that the members of parliament and senate need to really look at that, that the meaning does not become misconstrued by the language. And I think the people who are the lawyers behind the language of the bill have to be careful about what does it say? Or what does it sound like? Because you don't want it to seem like the, the person who's seeking treatment will also be 
the person doing the treatment planning themselves. Mm. It has to be in collaboration with the experts who know exactly what is happening. Of course, it's in collaboration. Yeah. Uh, it's giving them power so that it's not that someone who's mentally ill is um, fully incapable of yes, fully yeah. incapable of, of being part of the. Because again, just the same way, if a doctor asks you, "Where are you feeling pain?" It's the same with mental illness. Yeah. It's so subjective, and someone is the only person who can actually tell you subjectively what's going on with them. So I think, to me, the idea of giving them power is what that clause was intended for, as opposed to saying that, um, you know, holistically that everybody should consent to every step of what their treatment should look right, like. Right, right. Yes. I would like to open up to the audience, really, as, and I, I can see you want to respond as well. <laughs> yeah. um, the issue of stigma, how do we deal with that? And this is now kind of taking yes. it forward. Um, I'll have you respond. And the gentleman here, let's hear from yeah. him first, and then we'll come to you. Okay, my name is Billy, uh, anthropologist in making the University of Nairobi. Uh, the issue of stigma. Uh, the case I can discuss about, let's say, for instance, I think the place where we really ignore is the parenting and the upcoming of the child, the children. Mm. Because one, it's uh, more important to consider on how are we bringing our children. Because we might, the environment that the children are going might be the cause of this illness. Yeah. So one considering the environment in which children are coming up through, that can be a, a very good solution. Yeah. Apart from that, we need people to come out and say, this was my issue, this was my problem. And here is the progress I'm doing it because many people are afraid to talk about these issues. I appreciate of some institutions which, like in the university, we have psychologists yeah. in place, mm -hmm. and they, it's very open to everyone. I appreciate Mr. Paul is doing a good job in the University of Nairobi mm -hmm. because they, pro they provide these opportunities for everyone to come through and explain the issues. Yeah, thank you. And I really wanted to get this as a show of hands. How many of you would say in your families as you were growing up, mental health is something that you discussed? None. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> this is just like a mini, okay, just one. This is like a mini <laughs> poll to give a sense of, yes. at home we never talked about yeah. it. Yeah. So even trying to bring it here mm. onto a national stage, how hard and difficult oh, yeah. that still is. I can see sure. okay. a comment there. Thank you very much. I'm Basil Odwar, a student from the University of Nairobi and also the UNSA chairperson, College of Education. So talking of the mental health, you know, like we've, been we've not been discussing this in our families. So the current situation, as, as we see it, we should encourage parents to actually advise the children, actually when having dinner or having some discussion, maybe if you see kids, rather students, yeah. you should actually involve them, try to get what they have try to understand their situation because mental health is not all about uh, people who are working mad, mm -hmm. but it's all about psychological torture, okay? There's some children, maybe from the poor background, yeah? You see, most of them, like when they're in colleges or they're in school, they face serious mental torture. They actually try to conform to groups of which they don't, they, they don't conform to because of their state, their financial state, right. and therefore, uh, Dr. I think what is better is that when we are advising parents accordingly, we should always tell them to in, engage their children mm. and even always be free. This will only happen. You can only engage a child and get, get, uh, get him properly when you are free with them. When a parent is free with his or her son or daughter, they'll actually tend to share almost everything. Yeah. And a parent will actually get good guidance when the parent is not able to guide or counsel the child, they will always actually seek relevant people or those who are able to counsel them and guide them up so that these children or their, their sons and daughters may not actually suffer from mental illness. So creating that atmosphere of openness mm. from, from the home, very important. Mm. We'll I from you just wanted to comment on the person asking about the anxiety disorder yes yeah. and that's one of the highly stigmatized conditions because it's not well understood mm. yeah. we mostly think it's the normal anxiety as we use it in everyday language but it's, it can be a severe condition and i just want to encourage that person to seek help there yeah. is professional help and they will basically get an assessment done and from there a series of therapy sessions where treatment will be initiated. Mm -hmm. Usually that includes 80% uh, psychotherapy, 20% mm -hmm. medication. And in most cases, uh, the treatment works. And 
in most cases people do get well and for the issue of stigma that is the biggest barrier towards accessing care so if they could just go over that one step if they could just go in they'll be able to get the help they need and i think as we close i really want to this is really big uh, in terms of suicide and the fact that it's still uh criminalized in this mm. country mm preventing so many, there was a story that came out this week of a university student's uh, suicide note that was found mm -hmm. and police officers looking to arrest this mm -hmm. individual and you're thinking that's not what they need. Yeah. <laughs> they actually need help. Um, but what do you make of that and, and where does that play in when it comes to the mental health bill as well? Well, uh, the criminalization of, of attempted suicide in Kenyan law is, is really one of the saddest uh, demonstrations of where we are as a society. Yeah. As a matter of fact, for me, the saying that guides the way I think is show me how society treats the lowest people in the society and I'll tell you what kind of society it is. And to me, if somebody is really imagining, you know, or they want to, they've gotten to their wits end and they want to take their own life, I don't think that what we need to do is to cr criminalize it. Uh, it's actually g giving them help. Mm. So to me, I think that it's archaic. Uh, my lawyer friends, my uh, judiciary friends know that I tell them to their face it's archaic. We need as a country to wake up and really start talking about just because it's in the law does not mean we have to do it like that. So we have some forward thinking magistrates and judges who have got into the practice now that I like, yeah. where if somebody appears in front of them because of that, what they do is that they actually send them for treatment. Okay. So they don't actually lock them up. So I think I want to commend the judiciary as well in terms of how they've interpreted the law. While it's written still, we need to kind of find a way of getting rid of it, seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to become the laughing stock of the world. I mean, mm -hmm. we can't be developing highways and all these things, but that's the kind of law we have. That doesn't make sense to us. So I think for me, the mental health bill will be one of the places where we actually figure out, like, you know, can we decriminalize? Or can we actually have a methodology of what to do with somebody who is in the middle of a crisis, like, like a suicide yeah. crisis? And to just touch on what we're talking about, about stigma, I want to make a statement to, to the country, Victoria. I don't know if we feel this as Kenyans, but I have a sense that our sense of empathy has reduced greatly. And it's time for us to start building our empathy. And empathy in this case means feeling the pain of the other person. I'm looking at social media, I'm looking at the kind of songs being produced right now after people have gone through tragedies and I'm asking myself, what society do we live in? If we are going to actually start making fun, creating memes as a, as a mm. society, well, Kenyans are very creative, but I also think that it's not that Kenyans are so creative and inconsiderate. I think that we have a general malaise that people are actually generally as a country unwell, mm. mentally. <laughs> For us to be making memes that actually make fun of somebody being attacked, I don't know if that's a, that's a well society. Mm. So to me, my challenge to us is to say, can we start really caring about the other person? And the Kenyan question of, how are you, the greeting, do we really mean it? Because our answer is fine, and we're not fine. So the question is, next time when you ask someone, how are you, do you really mean it? We will start exercising empathy if we really mean what we're asking and really looking out for each other, being our brother's keeper, so yeah. to speak, to say that actually someone might be going through something. And I know we can't tackle the question of mental health in one session or, or, or all the illnesses, but I think we can begin systemically by talking about empathy, not laughing at people. So stigma will be broken down when I can actually tell my friend if I see him laughing at something insensitive and tell him, actually, my friend, I don't think that's cool. Yeah. That's not right. That's not okay. Because I think if we do not do that, then we're actually perpetuating the stigma as well as people hiding and not talking about mental health issues in the country. Great point and a great way to leave it. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilua, and to Thank my you. extended panel, mini audience, for your insights. Thank you so much. And yeah, I mean, I think empathy certainly is the medicine. Yeah that we need, at least as a start, as a, start, that's as a society to deal with uh, mental health issues in this country. Thank you so much for watching. Keep the conversation going on social media, hashtag Citizen Weekend. Tweet me at Vicky Rubadiri. And of course, talk to each other and find out what's going on and be of help to your brother or sister. Have a good night. I'll see you again tomorrow on Sunday Live.